topic of today's episode could not be more timely. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that we all depend on the ability of researchers and pharmaceutical companies to come up with treatments and vaccines faster than ever before. And one of the problems is that clinical trials currently are very complex and can cause significant delays and also that there's actually not that much data available, especially if we remember back to the start of the pandemic. Chris Pang, my guest on today's episode, is the founder and CEO of PhysioQ, a platform that allows researchers to run effective, decentralized clinical trials using variable technology. It does that by monitoring for some of the most common symptoms of COVID-19 and collecting real-time data in the company's NEO platform. The company has so far worked with about 1,000 researchers and helped more than 20,000 families affected by the COVID pandemic. Chris drops some valuable insights into the future of scientific research, and he also shares advice for founders that are looking to set up companies in the health space and he shares some real nuggets today um, on how to actually sell to a market that's so hard to sell to like the healthcare uh, market which has long sales cycles slowly moving and strongly regulated organizations so this is a real valuable lesson uh, for anybody that's interested in the health space Chris is such a purebred entrepreneur. He has so many different startups that he has under his belt that he has founded in the past. So if you're looking for some real experience from a health tech entrepreneur, this is the episode for you. Enjoy today's episode. It's really good to have you on the show, Chris. Hey, great to have you to be on here. Thank you very much. Let's talk about LabFront first. That's the platform helping researchers to manage their trials and also tap into the sensor data and of, of the people participating in the trial so that you can actually leverage people from the comfort of their homes and they can participate in studies. Tell us a bit more about LabFront and why researchers need this new tool. What's the problem it solves for them? Sure. So if you're like me, before we started this project, you probably, if, if you're not, not a researcher yourself, you probably don't really know, you know, what goes into research. And for us, basically, it came down to an insight. We are, had uh, been working on a project where we're getting data from a wearable device, and we were bringing it up to a bunch of different researchers, just to, just part of this project that we were doing. It's, it was a, a project with a, a big company. But what we found was a lot of researchers coming to us and saying like, oh, can we also use that hardware to get that, you know, get that data off the device? And we're like, okay, why are so many people coming to us with this problem? And uh, after looking into it just a little bit, we found out that it's super difficult actually to get data off of devices for regular consumer products. So like if you're, you're thinking about, you know, the Fitbits, the Apple Watches, the Garmin's, for most people, like most researchers, they actually can't use those devices. What they actually have to use are specific devices sold by uh, companies that directly do uh, this kind of hardware. And unfortunately, those things often cost uh, 10 times more. So like, for example, Philips have makes ActiWare, you know, it's just a, just really just a wristband with some, you know, some, some features, not too different from a Garmin device. The Philips device can cost you from a thousand US dollars to two thousand dollars per device, where you can get wearable devices, you know, off the market wearable devices like with good brands like such as Garmin for around a hundred dollars. So that kind of was our initial insight into, wait, what what's going on here? What why why is there this you know why is there this disconnect? And so when we actually started to look at it, we started to realize that although the consumer market has been going like going crazy, uh, expanding really, really quickly. The research market has been very much left behind. And it's partly because there's not just not that much demand in the current market that they have as and there's not just there's not enough innovation happening because they don't see the market. And so Lapfront, what actually does is looking into all the things that, you know, researchers need. The main issues are other than the collecting of data, which is obviously very important. There's another huge problem, which is you're collecting data a lot of times 
in, you know, in, in sporadic episodes. So what I mean is you're, you're bringing in someone into the lab to collect some data. If you're doing a study, like for example, let's say you're looking at a weight loss regimen, you know, in a, in a, something related to stress. Okay. It's not like you can do that in one go. You have to follow them along three months or six months. But what happens when, you know, they're not in the lab collecting data in a traditional setting, they actually, most of the time are, uh, not collecting any data at all, or they're using very simple journals to write down, okay, today I did this, I did that, I did that. And what, what you find is a lot of times you actually don't, you don't get good, you know, quantifiable data, first of all, but on the second, you don't get good compliance because people just forget and they don't, they don't mean to forget. It's not that they want to forget, but it's just like, why are we using the system that enables, you know, just makes it so much easier to fail even if they want to. So when we started with LabFront, we're just we're thinking, let's make this entire process easier. Let's use consumer electronic devices to really, really significantly reduce the cost of of you know of each device, and then have a management software that lets you follow up on each participant to see how they're doing, and just overall increase your efficiency, reduce waste, reduce you know, the amount of time it takes to do stuff, and er everything is done through a GUI, so a graphical user interface. You don't have to do any coding. It's all done through a cloud-based system. Uh, is this is uh, inspired a little bit what by what Apple has done, for example, right? Like with the Apple Watch, uh, I think they've started to actually let you contribute that data to health research and things like that. Is is that some of the inspiration behind it, or is it quite different what you're trying to do? No, it's definitely it's definitely in, along the same direction. I think Apple realized as well pretty early that this data is going to be very very valuable. The issue that Apple runs into is even though they have this great SDK called Research Kit, researchers have to be very proficient, at least decently proficient in programming to be able to write your own app that can collect data using your Apple Watch. Or you have to be proficient at using the health API to, co to collect, you know, to write the code to collect the data from the cloud. Either way, what they're doing is going to be a little barrier to entry for a lot of medical researchers, especially, or any researcher that's interested in doing it without a coding background. And I think there's more researchers that want to do stuff than there are researchers with coding expertise. So that's kind of what we fit in to fix the problem. Amazing. Uh, can you give us an example for, of researchers that have maybe already trialed the platform or the typical type of researcher that could get the most benefit out of this compared to whatever they're using right now? Yeah, definitely. So we actually uh, we have a study going on right now related to actually COVID-19 looking into, well, one of the main issues is, the, here's a backstory, essentially one of the main issues is all, most of the data collected in with COVID-19 is very, very skewed because the data collected are all people that, are, that came into a hospital, got tested, and then basically stayed in the hospital because that's the only reason that there is a lot of data. If they it wasn't severe, they probably wouldn't have gotten tested, they probably wouldn't have come into the hospital, and then you don't even know anything about it. And then the second part is after, like after uh, they get released from the hospital, there's no more data as well. So the entire process is completely missing the pre, like the entire before, and the entire end, you know, and post. And that really tells you, uh, that really makes it really difficult to understand the entire disease progression, you know, how this disease changes like metabolically, what is, how does it, you know, how does your body react to it? And all these different things that would be very, very important to understanding this disease and other diseases in the future. Got it. Yeah, let's speak a bit about COVID-19 and actually the work you're doing there. You've launched a product called uh, Neo as well, which is targeted at families and individuals to monitor their health on an ongoing basis and monitor for some of the easily detectable symptoms that you could actually uh, look at. And what I saw as well, when I looked at Neo, you can actually contribute the data that is being collected to researchers as well, so they can tap into that. So tell us more about Neo and how researchers can now access that data to make sense of COVID and maybe generate a few new insights. Sure. I think before I go into that, I think I should have kind of introduced a little bit about our ideology, which is like, why are we focused on, you know, research? Why are we looking at science and technology and, and in this field is because we really believe that scientific progress is human progress. And we need to commit our resources and support the people doing this kind of work. And you see it with COVID 
how important it is for the like the mass utilization of scientists you know when when, when they you know all of a sudden there's a disease and now they all have to you know try to figure out the virus trying to find a you know vaccine you know this is what they've been doing their whole lives it's just now that we're noticing it right for the for a lot of people this is happening in the background it's not in the forefront so when covid-19 hit we actually have been developing LabFront for quite a bit of time. We we're actually planning to launch LabFront around the time when I was going to be in the U.S. or in around I was going to be March, uh, April, and May to help like get some attention and round and in you know, launch the product. But obviously, with COVID, that that I, they derailed our entire plan. So we had to think about okay, what can we do to that can else actually make a difference? And so. When we were talking to Dr. Andrew Ahn, who is a, a public health expert and a doctor at Harvard Medical School, he's also an advisor to PhysioQ. He was talking. He was thinking about, you know, what does the, you know, what does the state of Massachusetts, you know, New York was the number one, you know, hit place, and that, and then Massachusetts was growing really, really quickly. And he was thinking, like, what are the th- kind of things that we can do to, you know, help and what, you know, to prevent that from a systemic perspective, and understanding the disease, one of the main issues is that 40%, according to WHO, 40% of transmissions are actually occurring before any symptoms. So that means that, you know, like, even if you're using things like temperature checks, you don't know that, you know, you, don't, you like, you're not, you're going to miss out on you know, almost half of those cases. But if you actually look at the physiological data, like changes in the resting heart rate, you look at change, there are changes in their heart rate variability, their oxygen saturation, those all things are things that actually can predict, or at least I would say predict is the is a, a little bit of a, would be too too a bold of a word, but they they can have a direct correlation with uh, the COVID. And so when we thought about this and being having the access of these this data at our fingertips, we think, well, why can't we do a version of this that is specifically targeted towards families? Because in my case and my co-founder Jordan. We're all living far away from our families and, you know, we worried about them, but we don't actually have a way to really check in. And so using wearable devices and setting up family units where you can get alerts if someone's data is acting weird, you know, is something that we thought would be helpful for a lot of people. And Amazing. the second part that uh, you're asking for. Go ahead. So, and then the second part of that is, um, was about the donation of data because this is the part of the right. thing where not just you know this element of you know supporting myself but also like let's we're actually all in it together and I, I think there was a especially in the very beginning there was a very a large sense of solidarity with the you know frontline health workers but also you know the researchers that are also looking into this so for us we found that a lot of people actually were very willing to donate their data it's on an, completely anonymized but just donate their anonymized data to our data bank that would be provided for free to all researchers that were looking to do research into COVID-19. And so that's just the other part of the same, you know, same coin. Amazing. I'd love to uh, focus a bit more on your entrepreneurial journey and maybe some advice you can share with entrepreneurs that may be listening to this and that are looking to launch ventures in the health space. And Honestly, looking at you and your profile initially when we first met, it was really interesting because you got such a wealth of experience across so many different companies you've started and initiatives you're running. I think we could probably record 10 more podcasts, <laughs> the different things you've been doing. But let's focus on the journey and some advice you can share specifically, I think, around building companies for customers that maybe are neglected by other companies. So what you already mentioned is researchers are not really seen as a great market for many companies. There's a lot of legacy stuff, but it's not like the easiest market to break into. If you're starting to sell to universities, you're going to have like really long sales cycles and really complicated for sure, for sure. politics at play and stuff like that. What's your advice to entrepreneurs breaking into that health market and kind of actually to get any sort of traction in that complicated market? That is a very, very good question. <laughs> I would say help. aim for help, especially like if you don't have an you know, intense amount of backing behind you, crazy amounts of money, don't try to go medical right away. Because health, I think the goal for health is to kind of be 
somewhere between medical and health, as in like you want to make a real impact on their health, right? But that a lot of times means a lot of, you know, people think that means they have to go medical. I think there is a, they, you can progress to medical, but you can start with a more health side, just, just in terms of like getting something off the ground, like regulation wise, like if you try to go medical right away, it's just like, it's impossible. So, you know, like if you're just one person or, you know, just if you're just a, you know, small, like trying to figure out what you want to do, trying to move forward, I think health is definitely amazing like there's there's so many health problems there's so many things that can be solved and just choose one thing that you're passionate about and just take baby steps honestly it's not like it's not about planning everything from the day one and i'll just use our like myself as an example we actually started out randomly in in ethiopia actually so my one of my friends uh from track and field a teammate in college jordan his roommate was actually a norwegian guy who's, who grew up in ethiopia his family is, are, are all basically doctors most of his family is doctors he's the richard is the only non-doctor in the group and they were starting a hospital in ethiopia dr shell was starting a hospital in ethiopia and they needed help to start the hospital and then they found out they that, you know there's no emergency medical services system there's no like in the US we call it like 911 system like emergency number you can call and one of the main issues was is that there is no there's no maps there's no you know street sign there's no street names so if you even if you called someone you can't find people so when they called me and said like cuz i was a technical person it was like is there some way we can solve this our first impression was like, not, oh, let's build the first emergency medical service system in the country. My first thing was, oh, how do I make it, like, how can I use an app or something to, you know, find someone's location? Like, that was, that's how it started. So it's just literally very organically, we just went from one insight and one thing that was meaningful. Uh, you know, people in Ethiopia don't have a way to find the hospital to step by step growing something bigger and eventually becoming the first emergency medical service system in the country. But it's honestly a completely natural, organic, like baby step thing. And if I had personally thought about how much work I'd have to put in and how much like, you know, planning that I should do, I would never have started and this would never have happened. But instead, because I actually was naive to these problems, like that was actually a good thing for me. So, you know, stay, stay young, stay, you know, and that's, you know, that childlike brain and just you know being naive is naive to, to in some extent you know in like idealism you know I, I definitely think that's it has its values got it what's the biggest lesson you think you've learned throughout your entrepreneurial journey with physio q with kipo but also some of the other initiatives you're involved with like what's the biggest lesson you would share with entrepreneurs that may help them avoid it maybe or avoid making mistakes well since your, your podcast is very much impact focused. And I think a lot of people that are listening uh, might resonate with, you know, our impact message and what we're trying to do. It's something that I think is a double edged sword. And I think you, for people that are going into it, I want them to be aware of it. Not that it's bad, not that I would ever recommend someone not doing it. Just to, you need to be aware that if you're using, you know, the word nonprofit, you're the word social enterprise, that it has very different connotations for very different people. And you just really need to be aware of how you're positioning yourself. Because if you know, if you're going for a, re a round of investment, you know, I've had this, this problem, I have friends that have this problem, like their revenue numbers and everything look great. But they say they have, you know, they have this social impact. And then all of a sudden, people are, you know, they're getting questioned on all these things that even though a com comparable company that's doing, you know, equal or less than what they're doing in terms of your know, revenue and growth don't get questioned because of it and it's because you don't fit the normal stereotype of what vcs are investing in so you know you gotta you just have to be aware of that like make sure you understand how you're branding yourself and you might have to play a game you know to get your the result you want but you know, totally. Like I'm 100% supportive of the social enterprises. I, you know, I we are definitely considered us a social enterprise. But you know, it depends on how I say it because we're also a tech company and we also, you know, health tech AI. That's what we do. Amazing. I think if you look at the facts, obviously, what you're doing is you're combining technology with like also profit-driven business models to actually solve big problems. But you're also leveraging some of the advantages of running a nonprofit, right? So I'd love to dig a bit deeper on that because 
on a few podcasts we now had entrepreneurs like Alex from Beam, which is a homelessness crowdfunding platform based in the UK. They're basically crowdfunding training for homeless people and they're set up as a dual set up as well where they have a charity they have a foundation and they have a commercial operation next to that and mm. with physio q and kipo you have a similar type of setup where physio q is actually a non-profit organization and kipo is a for-profit impact-driven business however you would like to call it mm. Mm -hmm. give us more context on the reasoning for that setup and why you've decided to go for that Yeah, it actually just comes down to the market that we're doing and what is the best way to approach it and what are the best ways that we can ensure that our values you know, are always going to be aligned. So our whole purpose of creating the LabFront software is to help researchers. Now, if we want to help researchers, one of the main concerns is data privacy and control and access to data. If you are a for-profit enterprise, regardless if you have investors, and you are collecting a lot of data, there's going to be pressure for you to monetize that data. There's no matter what you, you know, who your investors are, there's going to be some kind of, and you're also fiduciary responsible to your, you know, investors to make money, as much money as you can. That's, that is the, you know, that is the MO of a, you know, of a private enterprise, or I, I should say or of a, a for-profit company. A nonprofit organization doesn't have that. They're, it, the only difference that I consider, like the, the way that I see it, is that nonprofits just don't have shareholders, right? They, it's governed by board of directors. It's you know, it's the team that's creating the product, and it doesn't invest. You know, it doesn't pay out dividends, and that's about it. You know, it's still re, you, you know, you re still reinvest all the money that you get into yourself, or you can pay it in staff. There's like you know, there's just there's no stocks. That's the that's the only difference, and because it's run by a board of directors, that is completely mission driven because they have no financial responsibility and there's no, you know they have no financial incentive to do anything other than what they were put on the board to do so when we set up VizioQ, it was really important to make data privacy the main aspect and you know we believe that's really important we also believe that slowly the world is catching on that you don't want uh, you know a facebook or a google to control this data and then sell it to the highest bidder What I would rather want, and this is what we believe, is that researchers are looking at this and like, oh, wow, we can, you know, this this nonprofit organization, they make money by the subscription service, and that's all they need to do. And as long as they, you know, as long as there's people using the service, they don't, you know, there's no reason to grow. There's no responsibility to anything else other than protect my data and provide the best experience and help as many people as we can. So when we set it up, we set up the organization keep we we commit 2 million US dollars to develop this software and help maintain it for you know for the in perpetuity you know just forever but we weren't going to charge you know the nonprofit organization that money to to uh, to, to build it, you know or they don't have the money to do that so instead what we do is we just we get we license it completely for free and we just get a cut out of every subscriber that they you know that pays for the service we get a percentage of and in that way No matter what, you know, if they don't, if they aren't able to pay it, you know, they don't, they're not up, they're not on the hook for the bill. And if they're making money because there, there are a lot of people that are using it, then, you know, they just share with us some of the money. That's, you know, it's pretty simple, I think. That's really interesting. I think, again, Beam, completely different business, but they've done a similar model where the commercial company is running the platform, developing the platform, and mm. they're getting a cut off what's being generated but still the kind of nonprofit is completely focused on making sure that the charitable cause is in, at focus, right? Rather than anything For else. Sure. So I, I think that's a great setup to see. And it's also good. I'm sure the listeners of this podcast, most of them really get this. But I think mm -hmm. if you look at the mainstream, a lot of people don't get this. If you set up a nonprofit, it doesn't mean you can't have really good revenue streams coming in. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and you, can't, you can also because, pay people very well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you should. And I think that's actually one of the things I'm very passionate about. I've been working in the past in fundraising and for charities as well. And I've been involved with a fundraising agency, which pays their people really well as well, but only in return for actually raising a lot of money. But I've been very passionate about that topic as well. But I guess the point is, just because you're a nonprofit, you could have like really good governance reasons or reasons to uh, align your objectives uh, that you just mentioned to set up a nonprofit. But that doesn't mean that you have to now 
uh, sell cakes, do do bake sales uh, to fund it. You can actually you can actually charge people for the software you're selling, uh, like you do, and generate revenue like that. So I think that's something that still people don't get sometimes. And it's really great to see entrepreneurs like you that have a more innovative approach on this and be like, no, we're we're nonprofit for these reasons, but it doesn't mean we like can't charge for your software, for example. So that's really good. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. I mean, you're still charging for uh, the cakes, right? Those cakes yeah, are absolutely. Yeah, you are right. Yeah, yeah. But it's a it's a side it's a activity fun. to generate something rather than focus on adding value to somebody and then taking a cut of that value, which is typically what companies do. Yeah, I mean, I think I I approach it the same way that I run the company, which is if we are providing a very good value proposition, then you know there's people are willing to pay that money because we're doing something for them that they value. You know, and so it uh, there's no difference and the only thing that is slightly different is just you know how you raise money that's a little that that, that part is definitely very different and so what we've done is our you know for profit and we've invested the money the resources the team you know over a year resources for an entire engineering team to develop this software platform but that's something that i was going to take an investment into this anyways i believe this is the future i believe that this what we're doing is valuable so you know in worst case we just improve everyone's current you know like research protocols but best case is we reduce the hurdle of entering research like it's so difficult to start research because how much money it takes to start a research project, which means you need to get grant funding, which means you need to know how to write grants, which means you need experience. And it's just like this chicken and egg problem where researchers that could be, that would love to dabble into it, like do what I did, which is start a tiny little project and then it start grow and grow and grow and it becomes a passion and now I'm an entrepreneur. You know, you, you don't have that in research. You don't have someone that's just like, oh, let's do a tiny little project because it costs so much money. So many people are basically stuck at that barrier. They don't know how to code. They can't raise the capital. And then they they never enter it but then that's such a waste because you know they wanted to do it why aren't we encouraging it like that's what we should be as a society encouraging people to do because what they're whatever they come up with whatever they find out in that research will benefit us because it's you know new knowledge for us so that's basically you know that's my whole mindset got it that's a great mindset. I think democratizing the access to research and research tools and allowing more people to contribute to it. I think it's a great approach. What, what's your view about how research develops and maybe the types of organizations that leverage tools like the ones that PhysioQ is developing? What I mean with that is obviously traditionally you're thinking of universities and academics and labs that are researching now i think especially in the last 20 years you've seen a lot of tech companies actually having really big research departments and doing like some gr groundbreaking research yeah. that's not even necessarily immediately commercialized but uh, like doing some baseline research like even if you look at facebook and neuroscience research and stuff like that obviously they have certain motivations for that but there's a lot of more more commercial organizations in this space how do you think platforms like yours can actually democratize research? And do you see like new players emerge where maybe even somebody's like doing some studies from the basement now? Or sure, how does it work? that's citizen science. Yeah, so let me let, approach it in two ways. First, uh, first is just right now, what's unfortunate is that the majority of research funding, because the majority of research profits is coming from pharmaceuticals. So unfortunately, the, that like that is the biggest business, you know, one of the biggest businesses in the whole healthcare industry. And so there's because of the supply and demand, you know, there's more resources going to that, which means that the products they're selling for those type of research are really high budget. Because if you're doing like a, a you know, a, you know, it's, it's a study by Merck, they have a huge budget. So you're going to sell a product that's very expensive. You'll sell, you know, a couple thousand dollars per device because you know that they can pay for it because that's what they do. But what's, un what's unfortunate is that you're missing out on the mass population. And this is the part about the citizen science that, that we really believe in. It's the personal maker movement, you know, the entrepreneur of one, the researcher of one kind of concept where there is so much you know inventiveness and in, in, you know in in the mass in the you know the the hobbyist i should say the person that's doing it for fun the person that's doing it for interest that we are missing out on all that potential because we make it so difficult for them to just enter the market uh, and when i say market it enter the field and so our belief is as a business and this is for people that are thinking about listening to us as a you know as a business is we're also thinking that this is going to grow a lot, you know, in, in, in the 
perspective of what they call like non-consumers. We believe there's a lot of non-consumers in the research market that just not, haven't entered the market because the barrier entry is so high. And this is from extensive research that we've talked to. You know, we've talked to so many doctors that would be doing research if they, you know, could you know, it was cheap and they didn't have to, you know, essentially learn programming from scratch so that they could do a tiny project. And we've seen this right now with, we, we have psychologists and, and uh, psychotherapists that are using LabFront right now to track the progress of their patient to not only do research, but also to, you know, cap more feedback so that they can improve their treatment. So, I mean, this is a kind of an unorthodox use, but it's also, you can see the exact direct value in terms of finding out, you know, how is, you know, in, in psychology and, and psychotherapy, it's so many things that have to do with, you know, the auto regulation of the body, knowing how much there's exercising, knowing much how much they're sleeping, all that is both important from research, but also important from a, from a care perspective. So that's where we see massive amounts of growth. And so, you know, our whole business plan is, is pretty fun, like pretty, pretty simple. It's we sell a really, really cheap product because we think there's a lot, a lot more people to do it. Other people, you know, there's other softwares that sell their products, you know, for about $10,000 per study, $10,000, you know, US dollars per, per researcher that uses it. Ours is very simple. Our motto is we're cheaper than Netflix. So if you're, you know, if you're willing to do your research, like you should be willing to spend enough money that you would, that you would have paid for Netflix for our subscription service. But there's a massive population out there that we think is just waiting on the edge to do this. And, you know, this whole, you know, being stuck at home, like the DIY movement, everything like this is, I think it's all coming together. And, you know, this is the next wave. Thank you so much. I got one last question for you, and that's about the next 10 years. How does the world look like in 10 years time when and if uh, PhysiQ and uh, Kipo succeeds? This is, I'll, I'll enter it in a simpler way because the, the, our whole Kipo thing is another, as an entire another episode yeah, that, we can, that we can chat yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely just democratization of research. People, you know, doing projects themselves and just figuring out like, hey, do, what exercise, like, do, would you want some data for yourself just to know what type of exercise fad that's, you know, on TV actually works? How easy it will it be to do that, to start your own project and, you know, invite 30 of your friends, some of them that aren't doing it, some of them that are doing this version of this diet. And then, you know, at the end of 90 days, you could just compare results. Just how easy would that be to do that now with LabFront? And so we see that it's just not just academic research, but this kind of like citizen research, citizen science is, I think is going to be a catalyst for academic research. Like academic research also is, comes in way, like, you know, there's also fads and also like, you know, things that are hyped and things that are fashionable. And that's going to come from people as well. And if people think that, hey, I want to, I think this project is worthwhile. Like, you know, maybe there's going to be crowdfunding research projects. Maybe there are researchers that are like, hey, what are you guys interested in? And like, people are interested in and maybe like, you know, keto diet or, or different things along that, you know, different types of intermittent fasting. Like, and a researcher could take that and say, I already have my participants, which is my biggest cost. They are willing to buy into their own devices because they want to track their own health anyways. And now I can run like a 10,000 person study for essentially free, you know, oh, not free, sorry, the price of Netflix, but. <laughs> so almost, that's you know almost. 10 years for sure 10 years that's that's where that's i so you know that's what i hope for from the physio q side is just we're gonna be pumping out more new tools right now we're focused specifically on data collection but in the future it's going to be on the analytics side as well to make it completely easy for anyone to be able to graph it you know and then you know have our own click and drag and drag and drop tools that you can run any type of analysis you want visualize it you know buy it you know in like pie graphs or whatever you want to see to see this and uh, using very very limited very small small bits of AI to figure out, hey, maybe this is what you'd be interested in, like self generated graphs. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed how you described not just a new piece of software and just another tool, but a, like a whole paradigm shift and how technology and building a tool like LabFront could actually help bring about that paradigm shift where access to research and access to running big trials or big research projects can be heavily democratized. And I think I find it really exciting 
to think about the possibilities of this and uh, maybe have it as common as a Netflix subscription almost <laughs> for people to be like, okay, actually, actually uh, let's do some research yeah. and uh, not just leave it to universities, which uh, are often also obviously stuck in like old ways of doing things and having to apply for funds and etc. Everything you mentioned about traditional research projects. I really enjoyed envisioning the future with you together and learning about LabFront and Neo and PhysioQ thank you, as, a, thank you. as an initiative. And thanks very much for joining me today. Thank you. Uh, it was great to you know talk to you. And I guess for the viewers, my last message is if you guys are interested in this story, we recently released a documentary called Every Drop Matters, and it follows the story of the Nordic Medical Center in Ethiopia. So you can find it on YouTube. I think we can put it in the show notes. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, you know, feel free to take a look and just understand that there are really a lot of good things happening in the world, and we just have to find them. And this podcast is a great place to find it. So I really appreciate you hosting and, and thanks for this podcast as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll definitely put that in the show notes, put your website there as well, etc. Do check out Kipo, PhysioQ and your amazing work you've been doing. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you.